Hello and welcome to Las Vegas to the 6th Infrastructure Summit by Structure Research. Joining me now on the sidelines of the event is Jeremy Pease, CEO of High Velocity. Um, Jeremy, pleasure speaking to you. Um, it's been a while since we last caught up <laughs> on <Absolutely>. camera. <laughs> yeah. um, I mean, how is the event going for you? What do you think of it? I don't think this is your first one with no. Structure. Um, how have you seen the event evolve over the years? Yeah, I mean, it's really an interesting time and especially here at the event, you start to really see, you know, a number of different types of providers coming into the space because of the growth of power, the demand for all these different components that required in the data center space. And so um, it's really, really interesting to see it change. The dynamics from 2018 when I came to the first one, you know, uh, to where we are today, obviously the data center market has changed dramatically in the last three years. So to see everything that's going on, to see what's happening, it's been very interesting to uh, to attend this event yeah. this year specifically. And especially if you go as far back as 2018, I mean, the world has changed dramatically tremendously, let alone COVID in the middle, but it's just the AI wave that's come with it. Uh, and actually that kind of segues into the, the theme of this year's conference, concurrence. Right. So many things happening at the same time, and this is exactly where this industry is, it's the concurrence age. Yeah. Um, we have AI demand booming, we have supply chain issues, we have geopolitics, regulations, energy, um, good and bad. Right. Uh, there's so much happening at the same time. What do you think are the main trends that are going, are going to influence um, that is in the development and growth over the next year or two? Yeah, I mean, I think everybody talks about power. Hmm. How are you going to get power? Where hmm. are you going to get power from? Um, um, and then I think there's a, a big part of the impact of data centers in locations, um, and that's where regulations come into play, mm -hmm. right? How is that regulated? Uh, how does the community see it? How are, how are people seeing data centers today? Um, and, and why are they fighting against data centers being in their locations? And so I think it's really trying to figure out how do you how do you gather that power demand? Um, what type of power are you setting for? I mean, that's a different thing in data centers now is, you know, when you talk about concurrence, there's so many things going on. You know, you talk about 2018, we knew what type of data center we were building. We were building them maybe at 20 to 50 megawatts was a huge facility. Mm -hmm. Now you're talking about gigawatt facilities. You're talking hundreds of megawatts and you're talking about power and cooling being delivered in ways that we never considered mm. six years ago. Um, and so I think dealing with that, you talk about supply chain demands, there's so many complications to it. Um, mm. It's just a very different industry now than it was before. Mm. Okay, this is actually my question. My next question was gonna be, how have you reshaped the business? And I think that's the right word, but you can correct me, but reshaped the business to go from 2018, where you, let's say it was business as usual, right. uh, to something that's completely new. I mean, there's been a recalibration of the markets, so of the whole industry has had, has had to go through a recalibration period yeah. over the last two three years. Um, talk us through the, the high velocity portfolio that you have now um, and then how did you recalibrate it to get to this point where you can help support AI inference, um, AI models, like how have you adapted for the for the modern age, if we can put it that way, <laughs> for the 2020s? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I think for us it's uh, how do we keep it simple through that process, even though it's so dynamic in terms of the amount of changes mm. that are happening, right? Mm. And so for us, you know, we really are a bare metal and cloud provider, which when you think about that, Power demands really don't change for that until we start talking about AI. Mm. And that's where we've had to change our model and our thoughts is, as you go from CPU compute that maybe took five kilowatts per rack, and now we're talking about GPU compute, and there's people that go to you know 100 kilowatts, they're talking 200 kilowatts per rack. I've heard because there's two megawatts. Yeah, of course, so there's, yeah. there's a completely new one, 2,000 yeah, right. kilowatts. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. So, um, but for us, what we've tried to do is make sure that we're true to who our business is, mm. and, and what we're about is really being able to get customers to edge locations mm. and provide internet connectivity, low latency solutions to do that with and provide that hardware at the end. So for us, it, the real change is how do we go from just CPUs to being able to handle GPUs and how do we find a GPU balance in the power per rack segment that makes mm. sense for us. And so how do we go from cooling that the way we did at five kilowatts to 15 to 20 kilowatts? And I think that's really the change in the dynamic for us where we've been focused. We're able to get that space. We're able to get the power we want because we're not taking massive scales of power, mm. um, but looking at kilowatts mm. per rack has been the change where we've yeah. had to focus. Yeah. Okay, and maybe I'll, I will strip it down a little bit too much this time, but if you look into a facility that you've had built or maybe a new one, we can talk either both or you choose one. How have you prepared it for for better latency, for, for better performance around AI workloads. How does it actually work when you put on the ground? How do you develop this facility to, to make it faster, more efficient, um, and I guess uptime as much as possible? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it, look, the redundancy that we build into these facilities is critical from, mm. from the get-go regardless, mm. right? So power 
we really haven't changed how we handle the power because mm -hmm. N plus one is always where we've been and we continue to do that. But where you're talking about is really that latency component. So we really have focused on our backbone, especially across the United States, across Europe, mm -hmm. building a strong internet connection backbone. So bringing more carriers in, upgrading from 100, you know, 100 gig per uh, circuit, looking at 400 gig per circuit mm -hmm. so that we can lower that latency and deal with higher uh, you know, throughput in terms of demand because mm -hmm. these AI work workloads are starting to push through you know internet capacity at a much faster rate mm -hmm. than we looked at before so that's really where we focus the most is most mm -hmm. is really around internet and lowering that latency and creating a really really strong backbone for our customers mm -hmm. to run on I guess another level of the business that has had to go through a calibration and there's no exclusive high velocity everyone went through these including the hyperscalers yeah it's investment strategies Correct. so the, the the market now needs capital like never before it used to be a well a few millions um, to a hundred millions yeah. and the, like big headlines would be one, two billion. Now we're talking about hundreds of billions and we're talking about trillions as well. Yep. How has the investment strategy, capital allocation, capital structure of high velocity changed over the last two years, even, even just two, three years? Yeah, I mean, you know, we've gone to a mix of, you know, three years ago, we were purely equity backed, right? And that's really where we were able to play. But now we have to look at things like pref equity. We have to look at, at debt, you know, uh, and then how do you start to look at um, capitalizing on the mm. facilities that you have to be able to get even better rates in terms mm. of the loans that you're trying to do. How do you recapitalize those loans? I mean, mm. it's just so many pieces of, you have to look at every investment option to be able to do that. Um, now look, there's so many different opportunities where investors want to get in the space. They mm. want to put money in. And so there's a lot of opportunities, mm. but you really have to look at what's the best structure for your organization mm. and for the projects that you're looking at, whether that's M&A or whether that's building, you really got to look at a debt uh, to equity structure that really works for your business. Mm -hmm. when, when you look at, uh, now not, not related to high velocity, but we, we've just it's had a huge headline this week, so a $40 billion acquisition in the market. Um, last year we closed it in 25, 24, last year was 24, it was in 25. Yeah. In 2024 we closed it with a, which was until yesterday, the largest debt asset acquisition as well, uh, with $24 billion, uh, Ameri uh, Australian dollars yep. at the end of last year. How would you see the valuation game changing, the, the multiples? I mean, we, we are talking about tremendous amounts um, at the moment. How does that cascade down to other operators? And how do you envision the future with all this? Because does it create pressure on you, for example? Uh, it's interesting because, you know, before 2020, and you kind of mentioned COVID earlier, before that time frame, data centers were seeing high 20s, right? Maybe even low 30s in mm -hmm. terms of multiples of valuations, right? And then over that time frame of COVID and coming into mm. like 2021, mm. 2022, you started to see that drop into the low 20s. And now because there's so much demand, there's so many things going on and all this money being invested, now you're starting to see those valuations pop way back up there, right? Um, and when you talk about how big these data centers are, the EBITDA that they're going, which we're building those valuations mm. off of, I mean, you start talking about that type of EBITDA um, at that type of valuation, I mean, that's where you start to see these numbers. It's not just the valuations going up into a realm that we haven't seen before. Mm -hmm. They're back up in that high 20s, maybe low 30s, um, but it's the fact that the size of these companies have gotten bigger because they're growing at a, at a bigger pace that you're starting to see these numbers that, that look astronomical, and it really is just these larger businesses with a, a significant valuation. Just, just, just picking up on your brains now, but what, what happens after this? So when you, when you have a $40 billion acquisition, how does it work after that? How do you sell the business? How do you break it up into different assets? How does it work? What does the next M&A wave look like, for example? Uh, man, it's it's always an interesting space because we have always said that, oh, oh my gosh, well, you, you purchase that company at this valuation, what does that mean? And is that, do you go public, right? Is is that the solution that says, all right, that's why your Equinixes and your your digital realties, right? That's why they're, they're public is because that's really allows them to expand as far as they want to go. I don't see anybody coming in and purchasing them at the valuation that that would take oh, yeah. at that type of dollar, no? right? <laughs> and so I think I think that's where um, people that are buying the, the investment firms that are buying these right now um, at a private level or the strategics that are buying them. I think there has to be a dynamic of public. Mm -hmm. But again, when you look at the billions of dollars that are being invested even into a single facility, right? Then you've got to think that there's money out there to acquire these companies even as they grow larger. So I think it is. You know, the industry is just focused on how much can I build, how can, how much can I go out there and do because there's so much to pent up demand that they can't even deliver it fast enough to fill it up. You know, they're filling it up faster than they can build it, yeah. right? And and all these are committed. So I think the values are going to be there, and there's going to be. We've it's proven that there's billions and billions of dollars out there to spend. So I think it's they're just focused on doing that, and then 
you'll see what the opportunities come in terms of when you go to sell or you go public because that's going to be the best way to get the most value out of the organization yeah. at that size. Yeah. I mean, vacancy rates are dropping all over the world at the moment. I mean, so we can't keep up with, with the demand. Supply is really outstripping. Um, so the demand is really outstripping supply. Yeah, um, absolutely. When we look into high velocity, talk us through your acquisition strategy, partnership strategy for the next couple of years. Um, what you're going to buy, how much you're going to spend. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, how much are we going to spend versus how much do I want to spend? Maybe those are two different uh, questions. That's a different question. Yeah, yeah exactly. No, I, I think for us, um, it's continuing to focus on the product lines that matter mm. for us. You know, really bare metal, cloud, uh, DR services, backups, all of that. Really building around that core component, but it's also yeah. around acquiring the facilities that we're in. Um, because for us, really, you know, the margin profile uh, changes dramatically um, if I'm in another other, you know, co-locators facility versus if I own and operate that facility. And so looking at opportunities to do that and expand our marketplace um, and retail co-location still is one of our four core product lines. So how do we start to invest in some areas where maybe we get some core tenants, but then we can really build out our bare metal uh, and cloud components in different areas and different uh, geographies. So that's really where we're looking. And, you know, I, I'd love to say, you know, we could spend hundreds of millions of dollars. And I think that's realistic over the next couple of years, whether that goes into companies or facilities, that mix will probably change. But you know, I, I see us spending you know hundreds of millions. We're not in the billions like these big guys that are building these crazy likely. facilities. <laughs> but uh, you know, hundreds of millions is still a lot of money to spend. Yeah, but I'm sure getting into the billion game very quickly because everyone is. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we'll get there eventually. Yeah. But I think in the next two to three years, we're yeah. there. But then at the scale and size, we would be there. Then you start talking the billions yeah. game. Yeah. Uh, looking into um, so the, the market, there's a lot of operators in the market right now. But what makes high velocity different? What, what gives you the edge? Um, and also, I mean, there's so many startups. How do you ensure that you stay ahead? Like, do startups have a chance? Not just with you in general as well, but what makes right. a difference? And can startups come in and disrupt everything? Yeah, I think we kind of trademarked a, a phrase uh, a couple of years ago when I came mm. on board, and it's you know giving the customer automation when they want it mm. and customer service when they need it. Um, and that's one place that we really try to differentiate because if you look at the models of so many companies out there, either they're giving you the automation to do mm. what you want to do, like the AWSs, the Azures. Uh, great companies, but it's known that you're not going to get great support mm. and you're really going to have to mm. figure that out mostly on your own. Um, and even if you look at our competitors, either they've invested a lot into the automation and so you don't get great support or, hey, we didn't invest a whole lot into the automation, so we're going to give you great support mm. to make up for that. We do both. Yeah. We provide you a solid amount of automation and a great customer service on, uh, on the back end. And that's where we really want to be known and differentiated in our customer bases. We're here for you on both sides. We want to make it simple for you to interact with us, mm. but we also want to help you when you need it. Mm. Okay. When you look into the next five years, where do you think this is all going? It kind of goes back to our original, our first question, but where do you think is all going in five years' time? Yeah, I think AI is just going to continue to play a bigger, bigger role in everything mm. that we're doing now. Uh, a lot of people will talk about, is this a bubble? Is this this? And, mm -hmm. and what are we really using AI for right now versus where that will be? Mm -hmm. I think a lot of that will be defined over the next five mm -hmm. years. Um, and so for us, you know, we really focus more on inference because mm -hmm. that plays into our strategy, which is global spread, being able to get to the end user. How do we make sure that that AI gets to the end user wherever they're at and any, any type of uh, demand there? And so I think that's where overall, you're going to see inference to start to play more of a role because mm. AI will actually start to utilize in a way in people's lives. We're already seeing it, but I think there's going to be so many different ways that companies utilize that. And I think that's what we're going to find is, you know, we already know that AI is taking a significant demand mm. on power, um, but I think that will change in terms of the impact to our lives. And I, as that happens, I think that will continue to change mm. our industry. It's changed it so much in the last two years. It's only going to change yeah, it even yeah. more. Yeah, the change is tremendous. But look, I'm just going to take a step back and I'm, gonna, I'm almost letting you go back to the, to the conference <laughs> um, because you mentioned you also have a presence in Europe. We, we've mostly focused on, uh, on the US because the conference is in the US. But talk us through about the, the international side of high velocity. So what are you doing geography-wise um, outside of the US? Yeah, so I mean, we're in over 50 data centers across six continents. So whether that's Tokyo, Singapore, Australia, South America, India, UK, Germany, I mean, we are, we are in a significant number of places because again, we really are there for customers to get to the end users wherever that is, right? And so um, that's something that's extremely important to us is having that 
that compute power with all that internet connectivity so that streaming companies, gaming companies, talked about crypto validator nodes, how those continue to grow, um, and even inference AI. That's how you get it to the edge. And so that's where we want to continue to play. That's where we want to continue to do that. But we continue to have an expansive international presence um, because our customers need us to meet us at those yeah. points in international locations to deliver to the end customers that are there. Um, and whether that's streaming for TV or whether that's streaming for even podcasts, we have a number of customers that need to get around the globe. Yeah, it's a concurrence world. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but Again, yes. Jeremy, PC of High Velocity, thank you so much for talking to me. Um, as for your home, thank you for watching and do check our website and social media for the latest digital infrastructure news from across the globe. At the capital, you lead, we report. Bye for now.